Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeology and Natural History Society, commonly known as SANS. My name's Lizzie Induni and I'm a trustee for SANS. Today we're going to hear a talk about the Twin Manors of Preston Bowyer by David Victor. David moved to Somerset some 14 years ago and decided to replace his botanical research by historic research, particularly local history. Since then, he has concentrated on the people and villages near his home in Wiverliscombe. He's previously carried out studies on the Perriam family of Milverton, the Turbervilles of Tolland, the Marriott family of Hestercombe and the Staywell family of Cothelstone and Lowham. He's currently working on an extensive study of the manor of Milverton and its other manors, particularly those in Preston Bowyer. He's given talks and papers on most of these subjects, and David is a member of the SANS Local History Committee. He's also a trustee of both the Somerset Record Office and uh, Somerset Record Society and the uh, Milverton District Archive. So in today's lecture, to make things simple, David is taking questions at the end of the talk. To ask questions, all you need to do is activate the chat button. Uh, it's at the bottom of the page. You just type in a question. To find the button, just run your mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three dots. Because we're recording this lecture, we won't be using any names in the question times. It's free to register for the talks, but we would be very grateful for a donation of £5 towards the ongoing costs of SARNS. The donations button's on the SARNS website donations page. To make things easier, um, a link will be uh, posted into the uh, donations. Uh, a link to the donations page will also be posted in the chat button at the end of the lecture. So over to David. Right. Good evening. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you for the introduction. Um, now I'll get straight into the talk. I'm talking tonight about the twin manners of Preston Bowyer, and I used the term twin, uh, so I felt it was particularly appropriate. These were two manners that for several hundred years lay side by side and shared very similar kind of look at look um, natures and structures. However, at a certain point in time, they went off in different directions. One stayed on its similar uh, on its uh, original path, but one became a very different place indeed. So tonight I'd like to talk about the two manners, their nature and structure, some of the people involved with them over time, and try and draw some conclusions uh, about them. And I'll start by talking about the geography. Preston Boyer is part of the village of Bilverton, um, which sits halfway between Taunton and Wibbeliscombe. It's about eight miles west of Taunton. And Preston Boyer is separated from the rest of the village by um, the Hill Ferrance Brook, which is a stream that runs from north northwest to southeast and follows the blue line on here. There's also the B3327 to its uh, just to its edge. If we go a little closer in and look at Preston Boyer itself, then the manors were laid out in this way. Preston Boyer Manor uh, was to the north and west and bordered the border of the uh, parish itself. To the south and east lay Torrell's Preston Manor, which was partly in Preston Boyer, but also spread over into Hill Common and Hill Farrance next door to the south. Between the two was the manor house the, um, for Torrell's Preston and its domain lands, which stretched northwards to the border. So it separated the two manors. Now, there are many similarities between the manors, and I'd just like to 
have a look at those as well as a few other problems. These were both church manners. Manners break up to, between two classes. Um, military manners, which were due to provide troops and equipment for the king, um, and church manners, which were there to provide for the um, Christian faith. Most of the people working in church manners um, were, sorry, in, sorry, in the church, of course, were, were concerned with um, the things that churches did, following the faith, uh, feeding the poor, those natures. Most of them weren't very uh, involved or interested in um, managing land. What's more, the two owners we're talking about tonight and their, their church um, owners were quite remote from each other, as you'll see in a moment. So it was quite common for the church owners to lease the land of the manors to what was called a lord farmer. And this was a, a gentleman from the country who had plenty of agricultural experience and normally quite a lot of money. Um, and he took a 21 year lease from the church organization that owned this particular manor, paid a sum of money for it at the outset and then paid a, a regular rental each year for the manor. He then had it managed, the manor, by his stewards, typically one steward for each manor. And the steward's job was various, to have various functions in it. Um, first, it allocated land to tenant farmers. Secondly, it collected land back when they surrendered land. Thirdly, they looked after, he looked after the discipline in the manor. So he um, had the ability to find somebody who didn't manure their land properly and keep their farm properly. And most importantly, um, he handled the money of the manor. So he collected fines, or what were called fines, fees in other words, um, for passing land to people. He collected heriots, which were payments paid when one of the lives we'll come to talk about in a moment died. Um, he collected the rents. So he, ha he handled all of the money aspects of the manor. Now, there were various problems with a manor. Firstly, the rents were all customary, whether it was the rent going from the Lord to um, the church or the rent from the estate holder to the Lord. Um, they were fixed at the outset and they stayed the same forever, um, for several hundred years very often. So they were very odd in that sense. And it meant that if the Lord needed to find more money to do something, he couldn't increase the rents, but he could do something else, which was he could charge more for letting land in the first place. So there were ways around it. But it was a very odd structure in the way we think about things. Similarly, um, tenancies were given to people on what was called a copyhold basis. Now, copyhold was a basis for issuing leases which were based on lives rather than anything else. So typically, a copyhold would be for three people, three lives. And I suppose originally it, it was meant to represent um, a father, a mother and the eldest son. Um, but as each life died, then either your hold on the um, lease went down to two lives rather than three, or you paid to add an extra life. And what's more, when one life died, you paid a heriot. And a heriot would normally be either a small sum of money, well, in our terms, a small sum of money, but five pounds uh, 500 years ago was rather a lot of money, um, or it would be your best beast. beast. Um, it was very common to have the best beast from the farm that would have to be given to the Lord if one of the lives died. The other real problem was that the farms were small and fragmented so that they'd be spread across the manor, a field here, a field there. Um, 
and the farms were very small anyway in our terms they were like quite like small holdings uh, and if we look at the farms as they stood say 300 400 years ago they looked very much like this in the two manors and they stayed in this structure for long periods of time so Preston, Preston Bowyer had 25 farms and they averaged mid 20s of acres each Tor of Preston, a much smaller uh, manor, had eight farms, um, and they were 22 acres each on average. And you can see the farm size is pretty much the same in both of them. It's just that the manor itself is of a different size. But 22, 24 acres uh, is very little land to keep a family going for a long time, especially when fines have got to be paid, when somebody dies and periods have got to be paid and all these things. So uh, it meant that they, people were poor and stayed poor. It was very seldom that you saw a small tenant, uh, a tenant farmer with a great deal of money. Now let's go and look at one of the manors, and uh, I'd like to start with Preston Bowyer. Back at the beginning, um, Preston Bowyer was owned by the Chandos family, and in 1170 they decided to um, uh, look to their future uh, in heaven by giving Preston Bowyer and Monk Silver Manor, another one that they owned, to Goldcliff Abbey. Goldcliffe Abbey had uh, recently been established on the south coast of Wales, and the Chandos family had had some part to play in, in establishing that abbey. They gave, it, gave the two to Goldcliffe, so they gave complete ownership over to um, Goldcliffe. And, Gold, and they also pers persuaded um, Beck Abbey in Normandy to act as a kind of father to Goldcliffe. So there was a kind of father-son relationship between the two so that the one could learn from the other about how to, to run their organisations. It also meant some degree of, of subordination between the two, um, the junior Goldcliffe to, to Beck Abbey. In 1265, um, during the reign of Henry III and during the Parliament of, of Simon de Montfort, um, feelings got quite negative about this kind of concept. There were quite a few uh, monasteries, uh, sorry, um, religious establishments in, the, in England that were subordinate to French ones. And the uh, feeling was that these should be broken, and they were broken, um, and they were taken back from this relationship and actually taken back from people like Goldcliffe um, into the Crown's ownership. So Goldcliffe lost... Um, both uh, of the, the two abbeys, uh, two um, th that have been given to them. Now that not only brought back the um, the manners, but it also broke back the brought back the revenues, which was uh, perhaps part of the reason that the crown did this in the first place. A couple of hundred years later, however, the Crown was feeling rather more generous, I think, and it gave um, Preston Bowyer Manor to the Dean and Canons of St George's Chapel, um, Windsor. And there it stayed until very late in the 19th century, owned by St George's Chapel. Now, as I said, um, Lord Farmers came and go came and went over time, and in the 16th century, uh, it was very often the Earls of Leicester, um, starting with Robert Dudley, uh, and then later the Sydney family. Uh, following the Reformation, um, sorry, Restoration, um, in the 17th century, it was the Sydenhams of Brimpton who had it for a long time. Now, I don't intend to speak any more about those, but I would like to pick up on something a little later, which is that towards the 18th, uh, the end of the 18th century, a very strange thing happened, and that was 
a lady was put in as a Lord Farmer. Uh, it's the only one I've ever come across, in fact. Um, but I think this was primarily an inheritance thing. Her father, uh, her husband had been a, a wealthy Bristol merchant who'd had the um, manor, uh, had the lordship. And um, when he died, he, she was the widow and, and took it on herself. And she took a 21-year lease, which was the conventional thing for Lord Farmers. They took a 21-year lease, um, which was reviewable every seven years. So she took one, lasted through two reviews, but then died before the third, uh, before the end of the 21 years. And she left the manor to her son, Henry Woodward. Henry Woodward um, changed his name to Lee Warner subsequently because he inherited the Dane John estate in Kent and part of the um, inheritance was that he should change his name to the family name, which was Lee Warner. Anyway, he had the, the manor for a while uh, as Lord Farmer, but it turned out he wasn't actually particularly good at it or particularly interested in it. I think it may have come from the inheritance of the lands in Kent. Um, but he failed to put the proper returns into um, Windsor for the uh, Abbey. He was supposed to do um, surveys at regular intervals and produce uh, write-ups of who had all of the estates and everything. And they, he failed to do those. But more importantly, uh, reports were coming back that the manor wasn't being maintained properly, and that meant it was damaging the value to the abbey. So they were on the lookout for somebody to replace um, Lee Warner, and they found a very good candidate, which was this chap. John Southey Somerville, the 15th Lord Somerville, was a Scottish Lord but held him high esteem in the English court, mainly because he was a farmer. And William III, the uh, king at the time, was known as, as you know, as a, as a farmer friend. Um, and he was taken in and made a member of the king's bedchamber, so a gentleman of the king's bedchamber, so obviously got on very well. But the most important thing from our point of view is he was one of the improving farmers of that type, time. There was a movement amongst some gentlemen farmers that farming had to improve. There were books being published to say how poor farming um, techniques were in the country. And he was one of the ones who wanted to change things. Um, and he was very innovative. He brought in Merino sheep from Spain to cross with his own flocks of sheep and produced improved breeds. He investigated feeding um, feeds for sheep and um, started adding salt and produced meat that was rather more uh, edible at the end of the day. But perhaps the best thing he ever did was he invented the what we think is the first two-share plough. Up until that time, ploughs had a single blade and he uh, brought one in that had two blades. And it was certainly one of the earliest in England, and we think it was probably the fir first. Anyway, so that's a little about um, our man Somerville. I would like to go across at the moment now and talk about the other of the two manners a little and bring it up to the same level. So, Torres Preston Manor, and it is always called Torres Preston, not Preston Torres. It's the, the reverse of the other one. The Torrells were a, a family that came over with the conquest um, and settled around England, quite a few of them in Somerset. Um, and they got on quite well in Somerset. But, uh, one became the Lord of Arb Brewer's Manor. Um, others were associated with Ilchester um, and had quite the strong links there. And one cadet branch broke off and came to Preston Boyer. And he bought an estate there um, in the early 13th century. Um, and then in the 15th century, he gave the estate, the manor, to Athelney Abbey. 
gain to the benefit of his soul, no doubt. However, Athelney Abbey was taken up by the dissolution, um, and in 1539 it surrendered itself to the royal commissioners. Um, however, it didn't stay there long. A few years later, um, the Parker family bought it and a whole range of other things uh, for uh, £722, 18 shillings and tenpence. Um, now, they bought not only Torrens Preston, but also um, they bought an next door manor, Hill Farrance Manor, and they also bought another one just down the road, Bradford Priory Manor. So they bought three there, and they bought some other manors in, in Somerset and Devon. So the Parkers had it, but they were quite a long way away from the manor itself. And 40 years afterwards, two generations on, um, the head of the clan at that point thought that um, he'd rather do something else than worry about manners uh, in another county. And he decided to do something that was really quite innovative. And that is, um, he decided to break it up into the uh, particular farms that were there already, the tenancies that they were there already, and offer either the opportunity to buy it out of their farm outright, a freehold, or for them to take a long lease. And the long leases were 2,000 year leases, which I've never come across anywhere else, but they were. Um, 2,000 year leases, a long lease. And he offered those to the tenants, um, but they had to, of course, buy them from him. Um, and they would have to carry on paying rent for 2,000 years. Uh, and then if the tenants didn't want to take it, he offered him them elsewhere. Anyway, I'd like to start off by looking at the one that went freehold. And that was a place that people will know if they travel through Preston Boyer. If there's a, a curve in the road in Preston Boyer and there's a farm on that corner. And that's this farm. It's Torrell's Preston Farm. It's the, was the, um, the capital mess of and the main farm of Torrell's Preston Manor. And it's still there. Um, anyway, it was bought freehold by Sir John Mallet in 1583, and he put it into trust for the benefit of the sons of Richard Mallet, his nephew. Sir John Mallet was a wealthy man. And he put a couple of trustees in charge, and they were interesting. They were Humphrey Wyndham, who was the younger son of Sir John Wyndham, um, of the Wyndham family, who had an estate in Wibbeliscombe, so a neighbour. And the other one was um, John Francis, the Lord of Coombe Flory Manor. So again, a neighbour on the other side. Now, in the short period, of, uh, the first period after... Um, the, the trust was set up. Uh, the eldest brother of uh, the three sons had it, but then it went to the youngest one, and he is quite interesting. I think Gowan Mallet. Now, Gowan, Gowan Mallet was offered a, a 1,000 year lease for four pounds a year. Kind of madness, a thousand years, but there we are. Um, anyway, he was a very successful farmer of the domain lands, there's no doubt. Um, he not only uh, looked after the, the farm world, but he did so well that he took um, two estates inside Preston Bowyer Manor as well, so that he could build himself a water mill um, and the, all the associated grounds that go with it. So he, he really did uh, quite dramatic farming. His son, Alec, sadly, uh, predeceased him, and he only had one son. Um, so when he died um, in 1640, roughly, his daughter Elizabeth was the only one left, um, and she had married Henry Poulet, one of the Poulet family, and they took the lease. Uh, I know little about what happened during their time, apart from the fact they had a son called Anthony. And Anthony took over the lease uh, in 1647 when the, the, his mother died, the father, the husband had died earlier. 
Uh, Anthony was an interesting man because he wasn't a farmer in the normal sense. He seems to have been a horse breeder. And um, in his will, uh, he was leaving horses to this person and that person and hardly anything else. Um, but he left four horses to um, the the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, the Pulit family in Hinton St George, uh, in exchange for being buried in lead in the mausoleum at Hinton St George. Yeah, I thought that was a rather nice touch. Anyway, whilst he was alive, um, he fell out rather badly with the mallets. Um, he thought that he had a total uh, handle on the manor, um, on the farm, and might do as he wished with it and didn't need to pay any rent. Um, it was just his to do as he wished with. Whereas the mallets, uh, who uh, thought that it really belonged to them, and there was a very bitter uh, court case in Chancery um, between the two sides. Um, it was Sir Thomas uh, Mallet originally, and then his widow, Dame Janet, um, and Anthony, and they, they really got at each other. However, at the end of it, um, Anthony poorly lost it. And when he died, the property reverted to the Mallet family. Now, the member of the Mallet family it reverted to was a man called Baldwin Mallet at St Audrey's, because that's where the estate belonged. Um, he was the Lord of St Audrey's at the time. But more importantly, he was the receiver, of, receiver general for taxes for Somerset and Bristol. And he spent most of his time kind of wandering around the country, um, persuading, cajoling and everything else, people to pay their taxes. And he'd then send the money back to um, a man called uh, Veal, um, Richard Veal, who was a wealthy Exeter uh, merchant. And he was supposed to care, care for the money until uh, it was needed to go to, to uh, the court. However, um, as often happens in these such situations, Veal decided he'd take the money and run. And um, he absconded uh, on a ship to the West Indies with £13,000, which in those days was a really large amount of money. Um, and that forced the Mallets into bankruptcy and they had to start selling, selling off their estates. Now, Bullmid Mallet um, thought he'd try and get the money back. He also got on a boat to the West Indies, but sadly died about halfway there. So it was left up to his son, William, to um, liquidate everything in sight because they had personal guarantees to the Crown that the money would be paid. So William started the difficult job of selling off the whole of the, the um, estates that they had in, in Somerset, which were very extensive. Our particular one of interest, Torres Preston Farm, wasn't actually sold until 1744 when it was bought by this guy, Canon Southey. Um, he bought the farm. Canon Southey uh, lived in Fitzhead Court in Fitzhead. Uh, he was the grandson of the Canons, who, the last Canons, who were the big family who'd lived there for a long time before. He was a lawyer uh, based in Taunton, made a great deal of money, very successful lawyer, and spent it all on land and built up an enormous bank of land in Somerset. In 1768, he died. And when he died, he didn't have an heir. His wife predeceased him, as did his only child, a girl, daughter. Um, so the question was, where would the money go? Where would the land go? Well, he had cousins who lived in Lydia St. Lawrence, and he also had a more remote cousin who was uh, Robert Southey, the poet laureate, um, all of whom would like a share of it. However, he left it by will to Lord Somerville, um, the person who we saw just now, who was three years old at the time. Um, 
and it was in trust for Somerville. The cousins took him to, to sorry, to, took the estate to court, as it were, took that to Chancery. And it, in fact, last, lasted in Chancery for nearly 30 years before the will was actually cleared. So by that time, Sully was um, in his 30s when he inherited it. So we have the situation again now that John Southey Somerville now owns the major farm in Preston Boyer, uh, Preston, uh, Torrance Preston Farm, and he also controls Preston Boyer Manor. So he's now becoming quite an important person. He also owned, um, fr and from uh, Southey, uh, from uh, Canon Southey, he inherited some interesting lands that were associated with uh, Preston Boyer. So there was a place called Kingsham, which was in the next part of Milverton to Preston Boyer, 30 acres. Uh, there was Cannons and Westcombe, which were part of Torrell's Preston. Um, there was Pyle's Farm in Hill Farrants next door. So these things were all appropriately close to his other interests uh, in Preston Boyer itself. Now, before we go and look at what happened to those, I'd just like to look at the other eight farms. There were uh, nine farms altogether when they split up Torrance Preston Manor, and one went to Freehold, and the other eight were all, all leasehold farms of 2,000 years. In fact, one was a little later than the rest because the last one on this list, list Bladegroves, wasn't actually let until 1659 because there'd been a, a life ownership on it up until that time. But as you can see, it's only eight pounds, seven, seven shillings and ten pence, total rent for the whole lot anyway. Um, anyway, so I'd like to talk about a couple of people here who took farms or were involved in these farms um, because it's interesting to look at what freedoms they had to develop their fortunes, if you like. And I'll start with Samuel Raymond at the bottom there with Bladegroves. This is Bladegroves today. Samuel Raymond inherited it, uh, sorry, bought it. And then his son, Samuel Raymond Jr., inherited it in 1677. And he also inherited one of the other small ones, Beat, because his sister had bought it and died at the same time as, her father, as the father within a year of him. So he had some land, a significant bit of land in, in the uh, manor, and he owned it on a 2,000 year lease. He then got, went on a, a buying spree, as you might say, over the next 20 odd years, and he bought Buttles Mead, he bought Popesland, he bought Abbotsland, um, and he leased Torrell's Preston Farm. It was owned by somebody, but he leased it for, uh, on a 21-year lease. So he built up really quite a significant holding um, across the whole of the manor. And then he died. Um, now, he died in 1706 um, without an heir. Um, and his widow wasn't very interested in farming, I think, so she thought she'd take the money and run. But when she took it to Edward Clark, and we'll talk about him in a moment, he added up uh, the value and he subtracted from it the money that um, Samuel Raymond had borrowed, the debts that were outstanding to various people, and the balance was £48. So the the widow got a, a, an amount of £48 for the estate. However, Edward Clark then had a series of lands that he controlled, and he consolidated that all into one farm, Blaygrove's farm. And that's why there was that big building there. And just a word about the Clarks. Um, a cadet branch of the... Uh, uh, the war family of Hestercombe um, settled in a place called Chipley Park, which is on the south side of Milverton, um, 
about a couple of hundred years before this, and he built up an estate there, buying stuff here and there. Well, like many families, um, in the end, his descendant was a daughter who married, um, and quite quickly after that, there was a marriage transaction that brought all of that fortune and the house to um, Edward Clark I. So here we have a, a wealthy man who's also very keen on building estates. So he carried on buying property. His son, Edward II, carried on doing the same thing. His son, Jep, carried on doing the same thing. And his son, well, he did a bit of it as well. So they built up really a very large estate, part of which was on the manor we're talking about, but part of it was just generally in Milverton. I'll come back to them in a minute because I'd like to talk about another one of these people who took a farm. Well, no, he didn't take a farm from here. His father did. Um, but uh, William Chilcott of Breedy. Breedy is um, a place in the head of the Bride Valley in Dorset. And William Chilcott uh, married a lady called Mabella, who was a member of the Bragg family, who brought him a farm with her when they married. So he lived in a farm in Breedy. And in 1630 something, not quite sure of the date, he bought a manor. He bought Eastwood Woodsford Manor from a man called Francis Matthews, who was a Roman Catholic, uh, Brecchison. And at the time, Roman Catholics were in danger of losing land at all to, well, their estates at all times um, through sequestration. So Francis Matthews was quite keen to, to sell the manor um, because money was more easily um, hidden than, than land was. But sufficiently happy that he was happy to take a down payment and then have the rest paid whenever um, Chilcott could afford to pay it. 1641, William Chilcott got together with his father, another William Chilcott, who was a yeoman farmer in uh, Milverton and who had leases on Torrell's Preston Farm, Blade Groves, and a place called Love Lynch, which was a Milverton manor uh, estate. And for a matter of £250 in, in money and quite a lot of gifts, uh, the father passed all this land to. William Chilcott. So William Chilcott now had control of quite a lot of land, some in Dorset, some in Somerset. And he put all his properties in trust um, for two reasons. One was to pay his debts. He had debts from uh, Francis Matthews to pay. And secondly, to raise portions for his um, children when they reached their majority. And he also agreed with Francis Matthews subsequently to take on Francis' debts to Jordan in exchange for, you know, for his own debts. So he built up quite a nice situation, and then he did something quite extraordinary. He went up to Bristol and he bought a colonelcy for himself at the beginning of the Civil War for Ashley Cooper's Regiment of Foot. Um, Ashley Cooper, interesting man, because he was a turncoat. He started as a, a royalist, then became a Commonwealth officer. And then at the end of the Commonwealth, he voted to get um, Charles II back on the throne. He couldn't quite make up his mind what it was, but I think he was always just looking after his own interest. Anyway, um, he bought a, a, a colonelcy in Ashley Cooper's regiment of foot, um, but he didn't really do him very much good because the following year he died. Now, we don't know how he died, um, but he died at Exeter or just outside Exeter. Um, we're not sure if it was in battle or whether it was illness. I think it was probably illness. Uh, anyway, we do know that following this, his property was sequestrated. Yes, um, he lost it all to the government because he'd been a royalist officer. 
Now, this put John Jordan, whose loans have been piled on, onto him, um, into a rather difficult situation because he wanted to get his money back. And he couldn't get any interest because the land was sequestrated. Um, he couldn't sell it. Uh, he was really stuck. Anyway, not to put too fine a point on it, he, he then started um, going to court. And there were a series of court cases which went on for 50 years, partly from John Jordan and partly from John Jordan, his son, who was his um, executor. And in the end, they won and took over the whole of the um, trust and were able to sell it to Edward Clark II again. So Edward Clark II now was in a very um, happy situation. He had all kinds of lands and, and stuff that he got hold of. And he started acting almost as if he owned it. Um, but of course, he didn't really own the land. The, everything was on 2,000-year leases. And this caused a certain amount of problem. And in particular, in 1706, John Parker, um, the latest of the Parkers, asserted his lordship over these lands and went to court. So he went to Chancery to prove that he was um, still the lord of these manors, or these lands, shall I say. And he won. And for the next hundred years, um, the Parkers remained as lords of the manor of Torres Preston. I thought I'd put this picture in because uh, this is the Parker that was there mainly during that century. It's a very well-known picture. And it's quite nice to be able to tie people to pictures that you uh, find of them. And he, he was a personal friend of Joshua Reynolds and uh, had this painted as his portrait. 1794, the last of the clerks died. Um, and he, he was a single man, uh, didn't have an heir, and he left Blaygroves, which he owned, to Edward North Norton. And he left the rest of the lands to uh, a couple called Elizabeth and Thomas Wally, Wally, Wally. But Nerton got Blaygroves. And in 1802, um, Norton, uh, Norton bought the lordship of um, Thoros Preston from Borrington. 1828, Merton died, and he bequeathed um, both the Blaygroves itself, which was by now a large farm, and the lordship to James Chapel, who was another farmer in, in uh, Milverton. 1853, Chapel died, uh, left them all to be sold. He wanted cash, he did them for his heirs rather than property. Now things started coming together in an even more, in a greater way, um, with the arrival on the scene of the Bedens. Richard Beden was the son of Richard Beden, who had been um, Bishop of Bath and, uh, Bath and Wells, and he had been uh, Lord Farmer for uh, Richard Beden when he was uh, when he owned the Manor of Wibberliscombe and Fitzhead. William Frederick Beden was his son. Anyway, they, um, in addition to the Wibberliscombe and Fitzhead estates that they had, they bought the Somerville leases when Somerville died. Um, so they bought Preston, the lease on Preston Boy Boyer Manor, and they built the properties, Toral Preston Farm, Cannon and Westcombe's, Powell's Farm and Kingshams, that Somerville had inherited from um, Cannon Southey. They tried selling them once and failed, but they tried selling them a second time and succeeded. And the second time, they sold the whole lot in one go to um, Alexander Baring, first Lord Ashburton, the Ashburton estate of West Somerset. Um, and 
it was short in the first place of the lordship and Blake Rose, but uh, in 1853, when James Chapel died, he bought those up as well. And to make a long story short, at this stage, um, that completed the ownership of just about all of Preston Boyer, both of manors of Preston Boyer. In 1854, the church commissioners, in their revision of the uh, Church of England's finances, forced um, Windsor to sell Preston Boyer Manor. And guess who bought it? Lord Ashburton did, of course. Um, so he moved from being a leaseholder on that to an owner. However, it couldn't go on forever. Nothing does, no matter how good it is. And in 1894, um, the fifth Lord Ashburton, as it was by that time, um, faced the fact that the bank had overextended itself in Argentina and it virtually, virtually was broke, and they had to sell everything. And the whole estate was broken up and sold off everywhere. Now, I'd just like to make a couple of quick conclusions. First one. I'd like to say a few words about the estate management under Ashburton because I think it's quite important. These are the stewards that operated under Ashburton when he had his large estate. James Knollys was steward of the estate for over 40 years, um, and the estate only lasted, what, uh, 50 years, so for, for nearly all the time, and he was replaced by his son, Cyprian, when he retired. And they also had a, a clerk who did, I think, 30 years on the estate, Henry Copestake. So there was a lot of, of um, regular ways of thinking about things amongst this group of, of managers. And in the case of Torrells, Torrells Preston, they were able to consolidate things greatly um, into Blade Rose and Torrells Preston Farm, so that they were just two farms in the end, and really significantly large, and I'll show you that in a moment. And whilst they could do that for Torrells, they couldn't do it for, and they also did it, I should say, for, for um, Wibbeliscombe and Fitzhead, they couldn't do it for um, Preston Boyer Manor, because up until 1873, it was owned by the church, and they couldn't do that kind of thing. It had to stay as small, uh, small farms. And they, the, the, the approach that they took was they did away with all the copy holds as soon as they could. They bought them out on each of the farms. They did away with the customary rents and Harriets, and they just went to straight leases uh, for time. They introduced new techniques across the farms. Um, they introduced mechanisation in places. They introduced horses to replace oxen. The uh, first half of the 19th century, that was one of the big moves in farming. And the farms grew in size and consolidation. Um, and if we look at the uh, sale brochure that um, was printed at the time that um, the, the Ashburton Trust sold up, then it shows that the Preston Boyer area had six farms averaging about 100 acres, whereas Torrell Preston, Torrell's Preston had only two farms, and they average 240 acres. Now, that doesn't show Preston Boyer up too badly against Torres Preston, but in fact, if you look at the detail, um, several of the farms in Preston Boyer were sublet. So there were, in fact, still 12 farms there, of about 50 acres. Whereas in Torrell Preston, you had these two very large farms. So I think. The main conclusion I draw from this is that um, the freedom that the Parkers gave to the farmers in Torrells Preston in 1583, when they started breaking the whole thing up, really was a great advantage to both those people and to their successors, compared to the straitjacket that was worn by the people who were um, owning Preston Boyer. So... That's my end. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much, David. It was very interesting. Quite 
extraordinary to think of those thousand year leases. I mean, what were they thinking? I mean, it's no wonder they thought they were owning the land. If you've got a thousand or a two thousand year lease, you might as well be owning it. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely brilliant. We have got quite a few questions coming up, actually, which is rather good. Shows that uh, people have been very engaged with what you've been saying. So um, where do you do your research? Do you spend a lot of town, time down at the record office? Oh, yes, I do a fair amount there. Um, I do a fair amount in other places, too. Um, not just that record office, uh, there's more than one record office. Are, sorry, sorry. I was thinking it was the record office. Of course, we need <laughs> the, the Somerset Heritage, Heritage yes. Centre down in Norton Fitzwarren. Yeah. Yes, I mean some of this stuff also came from Dors, uh, from uh, Devon. Some came from Dorset. I mean, it's come from various places because, um, you know, the, the, um, Chilcott was a, a Dorset man, so I had to find stuff down there from there. The Parkers were, were Devon people, and that stuff's in the Devon offices. You know, so it's it's a matter of digging it up all over the place. But that must be quite fun, actually. You could get to travel around, see different areas, <laughs> and actually spend a lot of time rooting around in records offices. <laughs> it is great fun. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's like um, doing a, a massive jigsaw puzzle when you when you find that actually everybody's kind of what, what happens in one area affects what's happening in another. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. And a lovely question here: the man who disappeared off to the West Indies with his thirteen thousand pounds, Mister Veal. Do we know what happened to him? I mean, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what did he no, spend it? <laughs> I have to say, I haven't even tried to find out about that. Um, I just thought the story was so so interesting. I got I got stuck with um, with the mallets. I thought, yeah, it, it was just so so extraordinary as a story. But yes, and got away with it. Neil was supposed to have been very wealthy in the first place, and that was the reason he was trusted to hold the money. Yeah, because he didn't need it. It must, have been, it must have been kidding everybody for, for a long time. Because maybe he didn't have any. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wow, yeah. I mean, it just makes you wonder what he found to spend it on in the West Indies, really. Presumably he could buy yeah. an island. <laughs> I yeah. Well, I don't know if you could at that time. No, I think I think they were all crown property at the time. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. What changes were made in the farming practice? You kind of touched on it with uh, because I know that in the 17th century, farming practices were changing a lot, weren't they? And um, you know, uh, different breeds of sheep, but also to do with the management of the land and. Uh, well, Jethro certainly mechanisation was, was growing from, you know, right the way through the Industrial Revolution in various forms. Um, I mean, I th in many ways, there, there are two great ones, I always think, and they were both in there. The one was moving from a single share plough to a multi-share share plough. Yeah. Um, you know, that 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 was just an extraordinary move forward because in one move, you, you doubled the productivity of, of what was going on. Yeah. Um, it and does make you wonder whose was idea it, was it? You know, was it Lord? I can't remember his name now. Somerville. Yeah. Was it him, or was it somebody he was working with? You know, whose idea? Was it? Well, it's it, he is always credited with it. He was sorry. One of the things I failed to say was he was chairman of the board of agriculture. He was he was a really keen agriculturalist who he wrote books about this kind of thing, and you know, I think he did quite a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And he would have known the right people to be working with as well. Presumably. The extraordinary thing is he died when he was quite young. He was only f just about 50, I think, by the time he died. Yeah. Well, from our point of view, that's quite young, isn't it? But certainly from my point of view, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've got yeah. children that age. Um, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Sorry, the, other, the other big one was this change from, from oxen to, to, um, to horses. Um, which happened in a very short period in the seems to have been about a 30 or 40 year period at the beginning of the 19th century and it made a dramatic change 
Gosh, I, I hadn't realised it was as late as that. I, I kind of assumed you know, oxen maybe 12th century. I hadn't realised they continued using oxen to, much later. There was a lovely paper, I've read about it recently, and I, sorry, I can't think where it is. Um, there was a, re, a paper published about it recently and about the advantages of one against the other because there, there are advantages. And, right, one of the problems with oxen is how you, they had to be shod. And how do you how do you put a horse or a shoe on a, a an oxen? And the answer like is you throw them on their side, and then somebody sits on their neck. You tie up all four of their legs, and then you put it on because it's not just a horseshoe; it's two parts because they've got cloven hooves. Little feet, yes, yes. <laughs> well, they have those lovely cow clamps, don't they? I, I know yes. about that in France. They always have squeezy things that you can put your cow mm. into. But apparently they there. used to do it manually like that, you know. Yeah, well, very different well, horses. Yeah. Do you know, are there many large manor houses left? Because you showed, showed a lot of pictures of really quite large houses. Were there I many think, around? Well, Somerset is has got a wealth of them all over the place, yes. And people <laughs> still live in these things? I mean, they're huge. Yes. Gosh. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, some, it depends very much whether the um, many manors didn't have manor houses. For example, Preston Boyer didn't have one, um, right? Because uh, nobody, no, nobody of that type ever lived there. It was always leased to somebody from afar, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was a sort of more of a farm. Torres than did a... actually live in Torres Preston, you know. Uh, yeah. It was quite a long time. Mm. And do you know, um, has Oak Manor ever been associated with the manors in Preston Bow yet, or has it always been separate? I think the answer to that is, and I was, uh, funny enough, I was looking it up recently, the manor was actually Hill Ferrance, but Hill Ferrance lost, it, lost itself to Oak. Uh, Hill Ferrance was originally the manor there. Um, and uh, it changed to Oak later on, so they're, they're synonymous, as I understand it. Right. Oh, well, I hope that's answered somebody's There's question. There's an, an interesting thing, and that is that Hill Farrance and um, Preston Torrells were both owned by the same family, and part of their leases was that you got common land, you could share the common land that the manor owned. Now, between the two, there's a place called Hill Common, and yes. nobody knows how, how Hill Common got its name. But my guess is that that was the common land between those two manors because he actually sits between them. And yeah. it was all... <laughs> so I think that's probably how it got the name Hill Common. Uh, what, what sort of land was it? Was it good quality land or was it? Oh, it's very good quality land. Yes, yeah, interesting that it was uh, rented out or leased out. Yes. Mm, it, was, it was all good land up there. Well, yes. uh, um <laughs> All of this land west of Taunton is, is good land, good agricultural yeah. land. Yeah. With Lord Ashburton's estate, where was it? You said it was West Somerset, but he was a wealthy man. Was he the chap who <laughs> bought out half of America? He bought half America, yes, he certainly yeah. did. He, yeah, he um, was a really wealthy He man. had four <laughs> estates. He had one, one in West Somerset, one in Hampshire, one in ex Essex, I think, and one in ha uh, Herefordshire. Um, they were all enormous, you know, thousands of acres. Um, as far as I know, he never actually set foot in the estate in Somerset. Where was the estate in Somerset? Where? It yeah. was Wibberliscombe, Fitzhead, part of Milverton, and the wall of Preston Boyer. Oh, right. And he also, he also had a... a, a, a um, uh, what do you call it? A kind of he had an option on Hestercombe um, at one time because there was a single a, a single lady there. Uh, he owned oh I don't know he owned all kinds of stuff. And of course he was MP for Taunton for a long time, oh, but he? before he ever got involved with land in in Somerset. How <laughs> oh, fascinating! Where did he make all his money from then? From America. He bought, bought America and sold it again. Sorry, he bought a third of America and sold it again. But, I mean, the commission for that deal was very big. Gosh. Because 
they didn't only do the deal for Napoleon, uh, the, the sale, but they also um, placed all the investments for it. Oh, good Lord. That was the Louisiana Purchase, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I remember that bit. Good I Lord. mean, it was a technical purchase in the sense that he signed the papers to buy it and then somebody else, you know, it was it, 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 it went through his hands. But in fact, the money was made from the banking transactions that went with it. Well, yeah, must be a moral in that tale somewhere. Mm. <laughs> be a banker. Yeah. <laughs> Another question here is East Woodsford, near Woodsford Castle in Dorset. I believe it's the same. Same. Or, you know, kind of next door. Yeah. Um, don't, I know no, no little more about it, apart from the fact the transaction took place. Yeah. Okay. And another question here. Did the whole of that part of Milverton that comprises of Preston, Preston Bowyer, on, was it on the border with Fitzhead? It, yes, it borders Fitzhead. And in fact, part of the farms towards the end spread over into Fitzhead. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Axbridge had many um, thousand year leases. Ah, so there I are thousand guess who year leases that. in Axbridge as two. Uh, that was set up in the late 19th, 18th century and the early 19th century. Um, so somebody knows. Yes. Uh, there's thousand year leases, but I just never come across a two thousand year one before. That was that was something new, new to me. Um, ah, well, yeah. This it's, person it's really knows. Quite unusual. Yeah, I don't suppose. Well, uh, according I can't to imagine this, how anybody ever envisaged it. You know. Quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very odd. Okay. <laughs> Um, how did the manors get affected during the civil wars of the 17th century? Well, I think the main problem was, um, sorry, as far as, as far as I know, there was no, um, you know, battles on, on the manors. Um, but they were, according to the court case, they were run down very badly. Um, Sorry, I've read, read the court case, the, one of Jordan's court cases about uh, trying to recover the manors, the land of the manors. Um, and he says that um, they weren't looked after during the Civil War, uh, mainly because some of the people were away and I think there was no kind of investment available. Um, and very often, I think, the, you know, quite possibly the crops and things were being taken by uh, soldiers going through through the land. And he makes really quite strong complaints about about the damage that was done to the farms and the way that they were neglected during the Civil War. Mm. Yeah, well, of course imagine. he may have been making it all up just to get up and get the get the stuff, but that's that's the kind of thing he says in the court case. Yeah, yeah, I think wars were generally devastating to farms, weren't they? Mm. Yeah. We've just got a couple more questions here. Uh, somebody would like to know, in the early days, not quite sure what the early days are, were any of the fields split into strips? And if so, uh, when and where were they consolidated? So Almost a, certainly. A question but, about enclosure. Mm, right. Um, in the early days, they almost certainly will have been. And in fact, this... But, but frankly, I haven't done any research in that area at all, so I, I wouldn't like to. I imagine comment. a lot of it would be open fields as it was, and then was enclosed later on in the 17th century. Uh, yes, but not enclosure in the sense of change of ownership, because they were owned no. by the manners. <laughs> oh well, that'd be something to look into, wouldn't it? Mm. And one last question here: Was the name Bearing to do with Bearings Bank? Uh, he founded Bearings Bank. Well, in fact, his father founded Bearings Bank, yes, is yeah. the answer. And it was Bearings Bank that went broke in 1894. Did they ever go bank bankrupt again? Bearings? Yes. 18... About 20 years ago. I thought so. Yeah, that <laughs> rings a bell. <laughs> they, they won't make a habit of it anymore, though, because they've disappeared now, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Ah, well, that was brilliant. That's wonderful, David. We've come to the end of our questions now. Right. And that, that was really very interesting. Thank you very much indeed for a super talk. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm sure they all enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we have a few more. We've got another webinar coming up soon on the 8th of February. And unusually, it's not on a Thursday. It's on the 5th, 8th of February, which is a Wednesday. And it'll be about the Shetlands. So this is going to be a natural history talk um, about the wildlife of the Shetlands. And I think that's going to be absolutely fabulous because I went on holiday to the Shetlands and it was really a wonderful place to go. We have other lectures coming up on the 3rd of February. Wells and Mendip Museum are going to have a talk on lead mining in the Mendips uh, by Steve Toft. And on the, another one on a busy day on the 8th of February because Queen's College in Taunton. Um, I've got a lecture on Malcolm X and the genealogy of black power by Ms. Dr. Tom Davies. On the 22nd of February, uh, the Sands Local History Group will be at the Heritage Centre and there will be a talk about the photographer Peter Wickens Fry. So um, all these events and more will be on the Sands website. So if you need to know more about events, do go and have a look at the Sands website. Um, that only leaves me to say thank David for his excellent talk and thank the wonderful webinar team who are all there behind the scenes. You can't see them, but there's Nathaniel, Tony, Alan and Emma. And thank you because I can't see you either. And thank you for coming. And hopefully we'll see you all again at another one of our SANS lectures. All right, then. Thank you and good night.